Um, let me talk about innovation and healthcare more broadly, because healthcare, you know, is as you know, right? It's it's a sixth of the economy in the United States and growing, and it covers many different aspects of uh, of subsectors within the healthcare ecosystem. So when you think about pharmaceutical innovation, that has gone through different eras of innovation, right? If you dial the clock back, you know, 50, 60 years ago, antibiotics was a massive innovation, right? That changed the course of human history and the quality of life. And of course, that was way back even, you know, well before we were all born. The innovation that has been relevant over the last, you know, several decades, first of all, in the 80s and 90s, there was a lot of innovation around what I would call really chemistry-oriented innovation. So this was medicinal chemistry, high throughput screening, uh, but the ability to really understand targets in the human body and then find uh, molecular agents that could attack those targets and have a certain pharmacologic response. So that was what a lot of the innovation in the 80s and 90s was that gave rise to lots of drugs that today are blockbusters and household names. So drugs that people take for hypertension, for elevated cholesterol, right? You know, for depression. All of these were essentially products that came out of the innovation wave of the 80s and 90s around medicinal chemistry, high throughput screening technologies, et cetera. In the years that followed, there was another wave of innovation that had to do with more of biologics, right? And biologics are also drugs, but they're totally different, right? It would be like saying, you know, you have a bicycle and you have an airplane, a 737. They're both transport mechanisms, right? But they're totally different, right? So biologic drugs are, are one or two orders of magnitude of greater complexity than small molecule drugs. And so there was an enormous amount of innovation in the 2000s and you know probably you know over the last 20 years around monoclonal antibodies around recombinant dna products right around uh you know essentially using uh cells right uh, mammalian cells or, or yeast cells as a biological factory to produce and express proteins that have therapeutic effect on the body so you'll see in a lot of the drugs over the last 20 years that have been launched have been essentially biologics that have to do with, um, as I said, monoclonals or or other kinds of essentially they're not they're not molecules in the sense of synthetically derived molecules like there were in the in the 90s and, and and 80s, right? And that innovation continues today. So you you see a lot of the top drugs today, most of them are biologics, and that's where a lot of the innovation is occurring. And as you know, pharmaceutical innovation is a long life cycle innovation, right? They can tow from 10 years from original concept through all the early testing up until it gets an IND and approval to test in humans and then many years of clinical testing before it gets launched. What I see now, the next wave of innovation that's occurring is really, which is very exciting, is around you know, the whole cell and gene therapy. So again, of course you have you know, the, the vaccines, cancer vaccines, right? And, and PDLs and PDL1s and et cetera that are changing cancer care. Uh, but particularly in immunology and oncology, there's the ability to essentially use um, gene therapy where you take viral vectors and you're able to alter the genetic makeup of the cell uh, to be able to express uh, different proteins within the body. So it's not like you're taking a biologic. Now you're essentially changing the genetic code of the cells or cell therapy where, you know, which can be allogeneic or autologous where you're taking cells altering them in some way using carriers, injecting sort of, so it's, it's getting to be much, so there's a whole another wave of innovation that's now at the cusp, and I think the next 10 or 20 years, the costs are still ridiculously high, um, but that will come down. So I think there'll be enormous innovation on the core biology, I think on the core technologies, on how do you improve the yields, the costs, and that will be the next, so that's just pharmaceutical innovation. Then if you look at med tech innovation, right, because uh, I had the pleasure of working across the healthcare landscape, med tech innovation has a whole another set of very interesting things, right? In the old days, if you look at surgery, surgery has been completely transformed during our lifetimes, right? In the old days, if you had a valve defect, they would have to do an open heart surgery. You know, it's like a, you, you cut the sternum open, you know, like a, you open a, you know, up a chicken, right? Kind of, you know, and then you repair and then you sew it up and you have uh, yeah, many lengths of uh, days of stay in the hospital and moreover, a very long recovery time. But now you can do that you know, minimally invasively. Mm -hmm. So a lot of surgery moved from open 
procedures to laparoscopic or minimally invasive, they're now going to endovascular. You now have the application of robotics. Uh, yeah, I now see actually very interesting, I'm an investor in a company that has a very interesting augmented reality platform that the surgeons put this, you know, this, this uh, uh, augmented reality sort of uh, headset on and that allows them to visualize in a better way and be more accurate. Is this something and, like and, uh, so you have integration with DaVinci robot or something like that or what? Yeah, so a DaVinci robot is one way, right? That's right, that you can basically have robotic surgery where a surgeon can, you know, where, the, where you have a surgical plan and the robot is essentially, you know, kind of uh, right. navigating through very complex procedures. But the augmented reality is a uh, platform as an alternative to robotics because robotics is quite expensive. And this is an alternative way to basically uh, guide the surgeon towards very precise cuts, better balancing, you know, perfect alignment. Uh, right, the, without having to use expensive robotics. So my point is that the application of these different technologies to completely changing surgery, right? If you look at orthopedic procedures, for example, right? All of us, if we live long enough, we're going to need a, you know, a knee implant, right? Uh, you know, uh, for all of us who yeah, have any more. kind of uh, osteoarthritis or joint damage, right? By the time we get into our 70s and 80s, more of us will need these kind of products. But in the old days, you know, you would need two units of blood and you would probably have spent four or five days in the hospital. Nowadays, there's very little blood needed, right? There's, there's transexamic acid, there's other you know, agents that basically obviate the need for blood. Uh, and a lot of this can be done same day. You get a total knee replacement and you go home, if not the next day, even the same day, uh, right? So it's just kind of almost miraculous, right? To see the advancements in surgery, the advancements from open procedures to you know, minimally invasive and laparoscopic procedures to endoscopic procedures, in general, you know, kind of less acuity, right? That ultimately results in, you know, better outcomes. Um, if I look at the healthcare IT, right? There's, um, the healthcare sector is probably uh, a generation behind many other sectors in terms of its application of technology. And there's many reasons for that, having to do with the fragmentation of the provider system, the economic incentives, you know, the, uh, but I think that's changing now, right? In the United States, they passed a law around uh, the ONC, which uh, essentially required uh, a lot of the existing vendors to uh, for interoperability. That makes it easier for people to get access to the data. And so what I see is that you're going to have this base record of information, which is the electronic medical record. But then above that base layer of data is going to be an intelligence layer that says, can I take this information and, and combine it and analyze it and use machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence technologies to be able to add clinical value, to be able to do clinical decision support, to not to replace the doctor, this but to augment the doctor, right? And yeah, go ahead, Sanjeev. Sorry, I can't hear you very well. Uh, can you hear me well now? That's better. Yeah. Perfect. Sorry. So uh, I had a good call with Nachiket Moore, who was the head of uh, Gates Foundation in India last week. And we talked about this data itself. And uh, I have some understanding and we have done some work with IMHE and then work in uh, evidence-based medicine too. So you and me both know data is very, very critical to our success. We even going to the point of when the, we are saying is data is new oil. And we are talking about hyper-personalization and everything. Do you see that happening in pharma industry in the near future, where we get a prescription based on my DNA data or some other kind of a microbiome to all other things? Yeah, so I do think that there is increasingly personalization in pharma, but, and I'll give you examples of that. Um, but there's also the... Uh, liberating of that data and mining it for clinical value that I think is much broader than pharma, right? So I'll give you both examples. So in the case of pharma, um, this is especially true in certain diseases. So for example, cancers, right? I think people have realized that um, there are many, many subtypes of cancers. Yeah. So somebody has prostate cancer, and you can say it's slow growing or moderate or aggressive, but within that, there are so many subtypes. And as there is better understanding of those subtypes and genetic variations of cancer, there's a better understanding of what agents are more appropriate as first line or second line or third line therapy. So there will be increasing personalization. 
uh, as you see companion diagnostics that are able to then judge, right? You know, if you have a HER2 positive, then you get a certain therapy, right, versus others. So there will be increasing personalization of, uh, of, uh, of pharmacologic agents, right, for, for the, pharmaceutical, the pharmaceutical industry. But I see the role of data in healthcare as much broader than pharma, right? Uh, yes. it, it actually goes into the right clinical decision support systems, right, to add an intelligence layer. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know if you, you're probably familiar. The markets are also starting to realize this. There was a, you probably have seen, uh, you know, Livongo, right? That just recently, uh, you know, they're a diabetes management company, right? That was worth, you know, billions of dollars and just merged with Teladoc uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very large transaction, there. right? Yeah. In fact, our... Uh, one so of our high the main challenge is... Yeah, I can send you, it's hard to hear you. When you lean forward, I can hear you. You're, you're a little bit, uh, yeah. So what I was saying is that the challenge in the healthcare system is it's incredibly fragmented yeah. in every country in the world, but especially the United States. And that's a function of how the healthcare system has grown up. So every hospital, is, it's got its own set of data. Every provider and physician has its own data, every lab, right? And the patients are there and they don't really have historically have not connected that well. And getting longitudinal records of data and I think that is where there is going to be an enormous unlock of clinical value where people are able to create, they have the base repository of data. But what I believe is that on top of that, there is going to be the intelligence layer that is going to be able to access and analyze and create a clinical intervention with that data. Mm -hmm. And I see that in every area of medicine. And then on top of that, you have an engagement layer where you know, the, that sort of engages the patient or the caregiver, or you know, their, their spouse, right, or daughter, or, or whoever the patient is, but also the care team, right, the nurse or the doctor, in interesting ways. And so, for example, um, you know, I um, um, you must know of a company, right? I mean, Cerner, Epic, right? They are all big clinical, Epic. you know, systems, right? That, but uh, many years ago, they developed, for example, these agents. You know, that so in the ICU, patients, you know, their their systems are in the ICU. And uh, patients in the ICU, if uh, you know this whole uh, uh, area of sepsis, you're, you're probably familiar with. Yeah. So you, where you get infection, and you know, and then if it's not detected quickly, if it's detected and managed quickly, it can be dealt with, right, with antibiotics or other therapies, and, and doctors can manage it. But if not, very quickly a patient can deteriorate, and and it just cascades down into multi-organ failure, and then you know the patient basically is very critical or can die. And so they can really build these intelligence agents that just sit in the cloud that are constantly monitoring these parameters and are able to send an alert that says, this is a patient who is at high risk of getting into septic shock. Yeah. That can trigger, you know, this may be monitored anyway, but just through algorithms. It's just literally an agent running in the cloud. Similarly, right, in, you know, in respiratory care or wound care or, you know, that's in the acute setting or in the outside, in the post-acute setting, right? Diabetes management, right? Where you have now the closed loop, where you see these interesting technologies with continuous glucose monitoring. So I think there's going to be enormous innovation. As I said, I talked about innovation in pharmaceuticals with cell and gene therapy. I talked about innovation in med tech with new materials, changes in the operating room. Uh, you know, you see some of these devices and you, know, you look at, for example, cardiovascular devices that are a real passion of mine. And you see what used to be these massive uh, ICDs, right? These uh, um, dual chamber defibrillators and how they've gotten so miniaturized. You know, they used to last two years and four years and seven years, now nine year, you know, years, and they get smaller and smaller. It's just fascinating, right, to see. Or if you look at, uh, you know, customized 3D printed implants, that's the other, you know, very cool technology that's coming out. In the old days, you'd get a knee and it was like getting a shoe, right? Size eight, nine, 10, you know, D, double E. But now I can get a custom built Personal. knee implant or spinal implant just for Ajay, right? Based off of a, of a, of a CT scan and a 3D printed NF1 manufacturing, right? So I think a combination of all these technologies multiply. And so I see the next two or three decades as frankly more change and more innovation than the last two decades. And so it's wow. a very exciting time so that's, to, that's uh, to be a participant in and shaping innovation in healthcare.
that is phenomenal for our audience because they are looking for opportunities, they are looking for ideas. So uh, there is some silver lining with all the uh, all we are going through right now. So uh, Ajay, I'm on the board of uh, TCNJ Innovation uh, side and they have this material science lab and they are working on this material because they find uh, there is not even a single material which can be exactly like the bone. Is it true? Yeah, so uh, all the orthopedic companies have spent a lot of time and effort to understand materials that can mimic bones. And God made bone to be a very interesting, uh, uh, you know, I guess you could, I don't know, organ is probably the wrong word, right? But material. And why is that? It's because its strength to weight ratio is fantastic, right? If you, if you throw a bone in the, in the, in the lake, it's going to float. Yeah. Right? It, but it has the strength to be able to support the human body. And so a lot of the work that's been done has been around alloys, has been around, not solid, right? But they're all very porous. They're made to design, you know, bone-like structures. And so I think uh, it's a fantastic area where somebody can create, you know, a material science where you can mimic the, uh, the, uh, the strength to weight ratio that, that bones provide. Bone, by the way, is a living organ, right? This constantly resorbing and adding, right? You're, you're getting bone cells that are dissolving into the blood, and then you're getting new, uh, you know, osteoblasts or whatever bones that are being formed. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a constant living tissue. Uh, and one that will be accepted by the body, right? It, it has to, you know, the material has to not create an immunogenic response that's going to have the body reject it. I think would be, uh, you know, so all of these areas, right? Material science, microelectronics, sensors, you know, processing, signal processing, you know, data, you know, processing, uh, AI, all these technologies are additive and multiplicative, and that's what's creating this plethora of innovation possibilities, both in med tech, yeah, as well as pharmaceuticals, but also the healthcare system and patient management for chronic disease or even acute care management in the hospital uh, in a very interesting way. So you think there is a time, there will be a time when we will really do healthcare, not sick care, because the way I see healthcare system today, it is designed more for sick care. I get sick and then I go and see the doctor. My doctor has no clue or no understanding of what goes uh, in between. Uh, in fact, uh, I don't know if you have watched the uh, live cast from Apple. They talk about a new Apple Watch where it can do 100 other things. It can capture tons of data and it can push the data of your doctor. So do you see that is going to happen in near future where we will be uh, continuously monitoring our vitals, even the oxygen level to glucose? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, it's, so it's, it's a very interesting concept, right? I, I would say that the sick care versus the healthcare I think of it as a bit overly simplistic. So my, my general view is that there will always be a need for what you're calling quote unquote sick care, which is we will always need proceduralists who can do high quality surgeries. Mm -hmm. We'll always need people in a hospital who can do the proper interventions when somebody has a, you know, a broken bone in an accident or has pneumonia or, you know, what have you, right? Somebody is going to need dialysis, right? Uh, so that does not go away. That will always be there and is an important part of the system. What I do think where the healthcare system has been evolving, although very slowly, is sort of value-based care. Where right now the, the, the challenge the healthcare industry has is that the economic incentives are misaligned, right? Because of insurance, it ends up creating a, a very complex economic transaction that's unlike any other sector in the economy, mm -hmm. right? You, you essentially uh, think of it as the very fundamental economic transaction in healthcare is different than most other sectors. Wow. The analogy I like to give is, so I'll give you the example. It would be, the example would be, let's say you go to a grocery store and you buy a loaf of bread, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You go to the grocery store, you pick a, you know, a loaf of bread, and then you pay the grocer you know, $4 and you pick up your loaf of bread, right? Right. That's the basic economic transaction in almost any sector. You go buy a car, you pay the money, you get the car, right? In healthcare, the equivalent would be you go to the gro grocery store, right? 
you're the grocer, I'm the consumer. I go to the grocery store, but somebody else will decide what bread Ajay will buy. Okay. okay. And yet a fourth person will actually pay you for the bread that I eat. Okay. So it's not just two people involved, right? In the in the basic economic transaction, it's a there's a buyer and a seller, right? That's the basic economic transaction. Right. In the healthcare ecosystem, there are not a, there's not a, con, a consumer and a seller, right? There are actually three, four other stakeholders involved. And so again, I go back to my bread analogy. You know, if you had an ecosystem where I would go to the grocery store, but I don't decide what bread I buy, somebody else would decide, and yet somebody else would pay for my bread, and then you're selling the bread. You can imagine how screwed up the you know the bread market would be, right? I'm just I'm I'm obviously exaggerating, What's right, for, my, uh, for for effect, but 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 the so the healthcare so what they what they tried to do over the last bit is to create more of a value-based system that aligns the economic incentives in a better way. That's one aspect I think. The other thing that will happen is uh, I think there's a need for a redefinition of what primary care is. I think what has become all too uh, much of a challenge in the last 20, 30 years is because of the specialization of healthcare. The primary care has simply become a gatekeeper and a glorified administrative role. And I think there's an opportunity to completely reinvent what primary care is. And you'll see a few companies around the country that are already innovating on that model. And, I, and I've had the pleasure of knowing uh, you know, some of these very interesting companies and they're totally innovating what primary care can be. I also think that chronic disease management uh, is another area where there's opportunity for enormous innovation, where you have, uh, you know, whether that's diabetes or COPD or hypertension or hypercholesteremia, right, elevated cholesterol. These are all chronic conditions, and a better way to longitudinally manage these conditions to prevent complications, right? right? If somebody has congestive heart failure, um, then doing the proper management of that disease up front can save enormous downstream costs. And so, okay, yeah, so, you know, is the Apple Watch going to go change healthcare? You know, yeah, it's, it's kind of a nice thing. You can now monitor your oxygen saturation. How clinically relevant is, is it to bending the healthcare curve? I don't, I don't, you know, necessarily believe that. Now, obviously, underlying all this is this massive burden of uh, disease in, this, in the country. And I think that has to do with, you know, much more fundamental issues of terrible diet, terrible exercise, right? Human beings were not designed to consume the kind of food that the food industry puts out today, yeah. right? So with the high fructose corn syrup based products with preservatives with, you know, so I think that, um, uh, so I don't, I don't subscribe to this, you know, sick care will become health care. I mean, and I think there's aspects of it that are correct, but I think it's way too simplified. I think it's the elements that I, I would consider that will change is going to be more, you know, alignment of economic incentives and value-based reimbursement and care in different ways. Chronic disease management, uh, redefining primary care, getting true centers of excellence for specialized care, getting better data and better decision-making, uh, you know, longitudinally, and getting more clinical evidence-based uh, interventions as opposed to, you know, economically driven interventions because there is so much gray in medicine that, uh, and, and there's such a variability in clinical practice from doctor to doctor and narrowing that clinical variability based on evidence. Those are the elements that I think are going to define the next 20, 30 years. Sure. No, I completely understand and agree with you on that, Ajay. So let's switch uh, uh, this a little bit more and go a little more objective in terms of the opportunities. So you and me both know artificial intelligence is now everywhere. And I talked to three gurus from different uh, major organizations in the last one week. And AI is there to solve literally every single problem. Seems like. Uh, on one note, we are talking about is AI is going to be a challenge and they will be controlling the robots and it's going to be a movie like Will Smith's movie, I, Robot. On the other end, we are talking about is we are not able to even solve a very simple fundamental problem is reading x-rays. Even today, all the images I read by people because we are using some AI, but the prediction level is very low. So uh, in your experience and the companies you are working with, what do you see as a challenge there? Is it the technology problem? Is it the data problem? Or we don't understand uh, the human body or each of us is, what is really the challenge and where AI can be really 
truly change our life? Yeah, so I, I, I wouldn't profess to be an expert in, you know, where AI may ultimately go and does it threaten the human race, et cetera. I know there are many people who have thought and talked about that topic, right? But from what I've seen, um, I do see a greater role for AI in healthcare across many, many parts that will, use cases will evolve over time. Mm-hmm. So I definitely see that at, uh, you know, at, at, a, at a disease level, at a specialty level, at a system level. Uh, and I've always felt that it's not a question of robots running the world or, you know, some kind of, uh, uh, I don't think it's a question of man versus machine. Uh, the models that I've seen, I think, will always be man plus machine, right? So back to your example of reading an X-ray, um, you know, you can get to models where over time you have enough intelligence and machine learning or pattern recognition built in, but it will always be a radiologist who is there to work with that algorithm to ultimately provide the right judgment, right? Um, so I now, will that mean that there may be less radiologists or less pathologists or, you know, whatever in the future? Yes, it's entirely possible, right, that there's some substitution. But the future will always be a combination of man plus machine. I don't see machine completely replacing man. And, and it's interesting. My wife is an internist, and we have these debates. She says, oh, you're going to have, you know, but, you know, of course, they will never replace the clinical judgment of a doctor ultimately. But I think it will be uh, uh, better decision support systems. And, and some way to supplement the, the doctors. And also, let's face it, there's very wide variability in clinical practice across many physicians. Sure, sure. And the ability for um, a, uh, an intelligence agent to be able to give suggestions to doctors or guide them or say, have you thought about this? Or, you know, I was uh, looking at one of these startups that has a very interesting technology around which antibiotic to prescribe if somebody comes into a hospital with an infection, right? Like let's say a urinary tract infection or a, and you know, three different doctors may end up prescribing three different antibiotics that have different efficacy levels. Yeah. And so could a, could a machine learning algorithm say, yes, here's something that's more likely to succeed, but ultimately it will always be the doctor decision, you know? So I, I do see that this combination is what will create um, the, the innovation that, uh, that I see. Yeah. On the same note as uh, one of my friends has a company called Dr. Evidence and they have digitized, I don't know, tons and tons of medical journals, medical data and where they normalize it so you can do a better research. What kind of medicine is working better on what kind of uh, Asian male, Indian or whatever based on age, gender, our eating yeah. habits. It's just phenomenal data set is available out there. So I agree with you that we will start using more and more data to understand what works for Ajay and may not work for Sanjeev or John. But uh, I want to change the topic a little bit and talk uh, something a little more uh, provocative a little bit. Uh, I'm not sure if you are uh, familiar with the term global burden of disease. Uh, The term is coined by a person named Chris Murray. Chris uh, is now runs the IMHE and Gates Foundation has, uh, has given him substantial amount of money. They have unbelievable petabytes of healthcare data. And his theory is, uh, as a society, we have a burden. So we have to figure out a way how we can really take care of the people who are not taking care of themselves. So what is your take on that? So are you referring to this as global public health, you mean in a lot of developing countries, or are you talking about the United States? I'm talking in terms of as a concept, whether it is for United States or other countries or anywhere else. Uh, the point he's making is sure. if there are people who are sick and the society is not taking care of them, there is a challenge. And how do we solve it? And he has presented unbelievable data, which makes me believe that there is something we need to do as a person uh, who can afford it. Yeah, I mean, global burden of disease is certainly a very relevant concept. Right, and the burden of disease varies dramatically, you know, by country. Um, I think you still have, you know, large swaths of emerging economies that have poor access to the technologies and healthcare, you know, uh, capabilities that we have today. Mm-hmm. And the challenge in those situations is not just providing the technology, right, the the medical devices or the 
uh, pharmacologic agents, but it's also building the provider infrastructure and the specialist capabilities to be able to take care of those patients. Right. Uh, in advanced economies, you have a different kind of disease burden, as I said. The biggest probably disease burden uh, that exists right now is around the whole cardiometabolic syndrome, right, because of uh, just lifestyle-related diseases, right, that have to do with, you know, whether that's uh, diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease. Then you've got all the inflammatory-related diseases. You've got mental health and, you know, disorders particularly amongst the, you know, the, you know, kind of uh, challenged populations in the United States. So I think the burden of disease and the nature of that, you know, burden is, is varies quite a bit, you know, by country. And then the approaches to deal with them also have to be local, right? Uh, one of our fundamental beliefs has always been that healthcare ultimately is local. There's no global solution to healthcare, right? Similarly, there's no pan-U.S. solution to healthcare, right? Healthcare by definition, certainly the delivery system is definitely local, but also the reimbursement system, the incentives, the training. Uh, you know, so of, of course, human biology is not different, right? But despite that, the this ends up being, uh, you know, very local solutions to solve these disease burdens. So the reason, RJ, I brought up this question is uh, because most of our audience are technologists, and these are the people, the are the engineers, and they are looking for ways to solve the problem. And uh, what I was thinking in my mind is it's a known problem. It's a real problem. Mental health to so many issues. I believe computers can do uh, the job of thinking in some of these areas and they may be better uh, trained than humans to provide some of these services or substantial services because a lot of the challenges we are dealing with today are uh, uh, all data driven uh, nature. And even the doctors a lot of time miss these outliers or miss these uh, data points. So do you see opportunities in that area where our audience can come up with uh, some startup ideas or something like the, which can change yeah. the world possibly? Yeah, so Sanjeev, I will tie it back to one of the comments I made earlier, which is, I, I think one of the big benefits of, uh, of our education that we all had at IIT was systems thinking. I still think that uh, you know the systems engineering course that I took or control theory or whatever, and just the ability to understand that what you do here has an impact downstream here and all the interaction effects, to be able to step back and take a holistic lens on it is very powerful, right? And I think that's a skill set that uh, transcends, right? Just an engineering use case, but just applies very broadly to life in general. So I think that for uh, all of the uh, alumni from IIT, that you know that that, that level of systems thinking and and uh, and kind of interaction understanding effects is is very useful. And and so back to your question of how can uh, scientists, technologists, engineers from you know solve problems related to healthcare? That's a very broad global question. I think there are absolutely use cases about using. Uh, the intelligence, right, to be able to change uh, clinical parameters, right? If you think of the world of medicine, there are really two broad buckets, right? You've got the thinking side of medicine and then the doing side of medicine, right? Right. The doing side of medicine says, you know, Ajay needs to have his coronary arteries changed, okay? The thinking has already been done, right? It's clear. I have certain blockages and the right decision is to, you know, do a, do a coronary artery bypass graft, right? Then that's the thinking, you know, then the, it's now the doing, right? So then I, I'm going to need very qualified interventional cardiologists or surgeons who are able to do that procedure, right? So there's the doing side of it. But on the thinking side of it, and I think there's opportunities for innovation and automation and, and, uh, and bringing intelligence to all of that, by the way. Right, uh, and then as I said, on the on the chronic disease management, right? How do you take a patient who has a chronic disease and manage them in a very proactive way? How do you engage them so that you can prevent downstream episodes and downstream costs? So I think there's enormous opportunity for um, uh, folks with an engineering background from IIT to be able to bring that intellect to all of these problems. And my advice would be, you know, the the devil is always in the detail. Uh, you have to go very deep into the use cases of whether it's a specific disease area or whether it's a specific, uh, you know, kind of where you're talking about 
uh, value-based care and alignment of incentives? Are you talking about this intelligence layer that I think will change the way that uh, clinical decision support works? Are you talking about an engagement layer that will better engage the patient where you can have new sensors, new alerts, new technologies, you know, personalization, more sophisticated diagnostics, right? There's lots of innovation, for example, happening. We, did, we talked about pharmaceuticals and med tech. We did not discuss diagnostics, but you know, there are, there's some very interesting work going on in uh, basically you know, uh, liquid biopsies, right? Where you are able to detect at very minute quantities certain biomarkers that are indicators of disease well before they become more evident Asia. today, right? So that, that then allow you to make interventions at a much earlier stage. Those are, again, very, you know, revolutionary technologies. Right now, people go in for a colon screening, right, with a colonoscopy. Well, as you know, right, that's, that's a relatively invasive, invasive. Uh, not-so-comfortable procedure, right? Now, if you could have a liquid biopsy that would have, there's none today, right, but that would have the same specificity and sensitivity, then that would be huge, right, because you'd obviate the need for such, a, you know, such an intervention. So I think there will be enormous inno innovation opportunities. As you said, you know, new materials, min miniaturization, you know, new therapies that are less invasive, uh, you know, uh, uh, changing the way surgery gets done, mm -hmm. uh, changing the way chronic disease management happens. All of these are, are infinite opportunities for healthcare. And my firm belief is that the next two decades will see as much, actually more change than the last two decades, right? Even with all the changes we've had in the past 20 years. Because all these technologies and are all multiplicative, right? They all add on each other, and that creates a very exciting time to uh, to be thinking about uh, you know, solving these problems. Our get excited when you talk about problems and challenges because we thrive on challenges. Uh, so I have a question for for you two, and this is more. Uh, so you are gold medalist from IIT Delhi, and uh, that's long time ago, almost three decades ago. If you look yeah. back your life. Have you envisioned the life where you are today, 30 years ago, where you'll be solving these kind of problems? Or, I mean, you know, it's just, I was just curious that what happens in your mind, how you really do these things today? And what advice do you give to yeah, our- so Sanjay, Yeah, so Sanjeev, yeah. So there are many different ways to navigate through life, right? Uh, I don't know if there's any right or wrong. Uh, I know some people who have a very planned and organized, you know, kind of master plan that they have marched to. And I wish I could say that in my case, but that's really not the case. Uh, I've always said you take uh, life is like rafting down a river and you take every turn as it comes and you say, what is exciting to me? And, and then you let the journey evolve. And I've always found that to be the more interesting path. So when I graduated from IIT, uh, the most you know, I had almost a, a fork in the road. Actually, it was three forks, three paths. Okay. You know, path one was to go and do, uh, you know, go to IMA, right? I had an offer to go to Ahmedabad and obviously very high quality um, Great. management education. Yeah. Or I had the option to come, you know, to the U.S. Uh, on a, a, for a master's program. Uh, I, had a, I had a fellowship at Berkeley, uh, which had a highly high quality uh, electrical engineering and computer science program, or Carnegie Mellon had a fellowship as well, which had a very high quality program. Great. Uh, not Caltech. Caltech, I did not get an offer. I was very disappointed, but I did have, have an offer from these two. And, and so that was the second choice. And then the third choice, though, was to go off and do something completely different, which was to go into an adventure in the oil field. And... Um, and I chose the third one. I, I went to work for a company called Schlumberger and oh. I had a hard hat and boots and was in crazy parts of the world. And I was in China in 1985 uh, wow. when Deng Xiaoping was the premier, you know, pre Tiananmen Square and spent two years in all crazy parts of China, right? In Daqing and Sichuan and Karamai and uh, all these crazy places, right? Uh, Wild cutting for oil. Uh, with a hard hat and boots and up to my cover, you know, up to my neck in, in grease and yelling and cussing and with a crew, right, uh, oh. trying to find oil. I cannot even uh, visualize. That was completely different. It, it was completely different. And then I spent, uh, you know, in, in Brunei and in Indonesia, and then I spent a year and a half in Assam with ONGC and Oil India as our clients trying to, you know, find uh, and help in, uh, in, in those oil fields. And then I spent a year in Holland in, in, the, in the North Sea. 
Oh, wow. So that was a totally different path. And then I decided to go, you know, get a master's in, uh, in business at Stanford and then have, you know, been in consulting, right, for almost 30 years. But every one of those was not some big master plan. It was really just saying, you know, I, I think like, like all of us, right, we want to be challenged. We want to have fun. We want to have a bit of an advent- adventure. And so my advice is to, um, you know, go seek the challenges, but, but ins- you know, make sure you enjoy the journey. And uh, certainly it's been, a, it's been a fun journey. And even after I joined McKinsey, I mean, I, it was not like I, I have ended up doing a lot of work in healthcare, but that was not by any grand plan. It was just, you know, as I said, rafting down the river, right? So it was just a matter of uh, kind of the luck of the, you know, the, the, you know, just the random walk. And I, I ended up doing a few projects in healthcare early on and found that to be a fascinating industry. And uh, I've stayed and covered a broad swath. But even within healthcare, I've ended up doing a broad set of things. So I don't think there's a right or wrong way. Um, yeah, but yeah, was I, when I was a graduate in 1985, I, yeah, I, I don't think I, I would have known exactly what I was doing other than, you know, I just said, what's the most exciting path? And I, I spent, uh, I slept on it for a couple of nights as to which of these three paths to go. And I went down this uh, oil field path and then I came back onto this uh, uh, managerial path. But, you know, there's no right or wrong. I think uh, everybody has their own journey to, to drive. So what is most interesting with this, Ajay, I uh, get it is first part of your life, like few years, four or five years, you were just exploring. And if I look back now, the last almost three decades, you are with McKinsey. So uh, what I am uh, was coming to alluding to that is when you are young, you should go and try and see what you will enjoy, what you will like. And when you find something you love, then you continue to grow and build deeper expertise and continue to thrive and create more opportunities for everyone, including yourself and your organization and your customers. Did I summarize it accurately? Yeah, I think that's uh, essentially very, very well put, right? Uh, it's interesting now, This day, I have you know, two kids now, right? And so my daughter just finished her, uh, her master's. Um, oh, nice. Actually, she ended up doing a, very similar, you know, she did, she did her degree in, in, uh, in, in electrical and computer engineering, actually. Wow. And uh, so she ended up doing some of the same, you know, obviously much more advanced than what I did, you know, 35 years ago. And that's what I told her, take risks. You know, this is the time to go explore. Uh, she just finished up and she's joined a startup, even though she had offers to go to big companies. And I said, just, you know, go, go, go. It's, it's your adventure, right? You can go to a big company or a small company or do your own thing. But uh, whatever it is, you know, if you're young, uh, just it's Take a your perfect task. time to go car- carve your own path. And, and I think um, what I would say is you always, it should, there should be a source of confidence from within that says, listen, we're all talent, you know, we're all blessed, right, to have had the fortune of a good education. So we don't need to worry per se, right? There's more, you know, people can get, you know, feel worried or insecure. There's no need for that, right? You're we're just, the, we're, we're in the top, you know, we're blessed to be in the top, whatever X percent, right? From an education standpoint and a skill standpoint. So, you know, go, go do what you want to do, right? You don't have to, you should just, your goal should be to please yourself, right? Not to, you know, the only master you need to please is yourself. And, and uh, that's the objective function. And, and I think that that will lead to, I think, what will be the most interesting and fun, fun career path. Yeah. That, that's the advice I give my kids as well. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Even my daughter, I was telling her the same thing. She's pursuing a undergrad from Babson, entrepreneurship school. She applied and actually McKinsey for internship. So let's see if she get it there. And she's very interested and excited in your finance department. Uh, but uh, what uh, I was... Uh, Exactly what you were uh, when we started our conversation. It's all about systematic thinking, systems thinking. How do you really put that and start solving problems? Once you find the problem you like, then you go deep, and then you really start finding opportunities. You finding areas where you can change the things. Like one dream I have, especially after looking at the COVID and what happened in COVID, is we have alert system globally for hurricane, for earthquake, and everything, but there is no alert system for humans. What happened with COVID, we have, we were completely caught off guard. I think there should be a system yeah. to solve that basic fundamental yeah. problem. Yeah, no, so actually this exists, right? So pandemic preparedness is, is pretty well known. I'm not an expert in it, but this exists. And I just think that the, the world failed, right? Frankly, the w, some of the WHO mechanisms or even the CDC mechanisms, but there is actually 
quite a bit of uh, work. And I think I, I remember seeing a TED talk by Bill Gates that outlined some of the things that at relatively modest uh, investment uh, would have been enormously valuable, right? And, and he had called for that several years ago, and I guess people didn't listen properly. So I do believe that the whole area of being able to have proper alerts, uh, be able to uh, manage or, or detect and, 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 and uh, quickly uh, intervene to prevent the kind of uh, catastrophe that we've had over the last six or nine months is, 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 is certainly, and I hope that's one of the lessons that comes out of the, uh, of the past, uh, past nine months when this is all said and done, right? When there's a postmortem as to what needs to be done and managed differently going forward, right? I, I very much agree with. And, uh, but, I, but I think to your point about, you know, what I would encourage people, you know, I've always found, and again, is that um, we're all, I think, for the most part, blessed with a very good education. So I think the analytical thinking, the systems thinking, you know, that's all there. You, you combine that with, uh, you know, communication skills, right? Written communication skills, you know, kind of verbal communication skills. And then you combine that with listening and being able to then work with and, and, and collaborate with others. I think those are all the ingredients that I see are, you know, the core elements that, uh, that can enable, um, you know, folks from all walks of life, right, to, to be able to contribute the most. Thank you very much, Ajay. I I can listen to you for hours and keep talking to you. This is really, really informative and I'm sure our audience will learn some interesting areas, especially uh, when it comes to systems thinking and when they can see the opportunities and how to analyze the opportunities. There are a plethora of opportunities. That's what I hear from you. Uh, Mackenzie has the best research, so I trust uh, your opinion on that too. And you are uh, living and breathing this for more than 30 years. So I would like to thank you on the behalf of IIT 2020 and our audience. It's, it's, a great, uh, it's great for me and it's very satisfying that people like you are uh, moving the needle and changing the world. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sanjeev. Uh, 